When Flexure was launched in 2007, they serve customers like large defense contractors, supply chain companies, a mix of on-prem and cloud solutions. They'll do a million dollars per month in revenue, up from 830,000 a month just a year ago. So nice growth, serving 5,500 customers. Many customers pay have several hundred thousand per year, which is great. Nice expansion there. And he's done this all bootstrapped, which is incredible by Adam. He owns 100% of the business. The company will profit call it 5% this year as he looks to continue to scale. Uh, we'll see what happens next. Hey folks, my guest today is Adam Sandman, who founded Inflectra in 2006. He's been a programmer since the age of 10. Today, he serves as the company's CEO. He's responsible for product strategy, technology, innovation, and business development. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his family. Adam, you ready to take us to the top? Yep, I'm ready. All right. So Inflectra helps customers deliver quality software. What does that mean? Oh. And an engineer would say quality is fitness for purpose. But for us, what it means is keeping the world running. I mean, that's what uh, our team does every day. That's what our passion is. We work with uh, companies that are in the biospace, utilities, energy companies, literally every sector of the economy that you rely on to get to work every day, to have power in your house, to have clean water. We work with those kind of companies to make sure all of the IT systems they have uh, work as they should uh, and, and going forward in the future, anticipate risks that might come so that uh, you know, as, as the world evolves and changes, they're ready to address those risks. So yep. uh, that's, what we're for, that's what we're here for. And we spoke back in May of 2022. You told me your biggest customers are large defense contractors and supply chain companies, a mix of on-prem and cloud. Is that still the case? Yep, that is definitely still the case. Uh, a lot of bio companies, I think, have added into the mix, uh, but definitely a lot of aerospace. When I see a defense, a lot of aerospace uh, companies, but also maritime and but large platform companies are making uh, big hardware, as well as uh, companies working in the supply chain, manufacturing space, uh, automotive aerospace, but also general manufacturing um, as well, IoT and those sort of sectors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's sort of fast forward the past you know, 12 to 18 months. I want to talk about sort of how you thought about product. Obviously, we're in a very different economic climate today than we were in May of 2022. Curious how you've changed or pivoted, I guess. But first, um, have you decided to sort of expand with the current customers you had back a year and a half ago? You had about 5,000 of you told me, or have you focused on expanding into new accounts? Uh, that's a great question. And we've done a, a bit of both, but a lot of it has been expanding into adjacent buying points in the same customer, ah. as well as referrals and partnerships. So finding working with partners that brought us deals and finding more deals with them. Uh, and then obviously looking at larger customers and finding adjacent buying points or following referrals where you know, oftentimes people are consultants, they move from organization to organization and they bring us in into those organizations. Uh, and that's been a large part of the you know, direct sort of sales as well as the partnership sales. And then of course, we're still looking for new buying points that fit our ideal target client. One thing I think we've done be a better job of in the last 18 months has been defining our ideal client we, we spent a lot of work this year on messaging and message development, and uh, our website is still in the midst of that transition if you go to it. So it's you'll see it's uh, in an evolving state, but really trying to hone down what is our, our ideal customer, what is our USP at a much more uh, at a much more deep level, not just the technology that sells you know quality software, but what is our client trying to do? Which clients do we find resonate the most? And then putting our resources into those clients rather than chasing everyone under the sun. Mm -hmm. So I think when it comes to the new sales, really honing down Obviously, we'll be opportunistic if someone comes to us, but not expending resources and not prospecting and not, you know, focusing outside of that core as much as we might have done, you know, 18 months ago. So I'm curious how much you've grown over the past 18 months. And then I want to drive deeper into how you decided what ICP to go after, because you had a huge bucket of customers to choose from, right? So what has growth looked like the past 12 to 18 months? Uh, it's been about a year of a uh, you know, period of a period, about 25%. So we would hope to be actually higher about, I think, 30, 35%, I may have said. So it's been a little bit lower than we'd we'd hoped. Uh, but what we, um, the reason for that, the number one reason has been... Well, just to be clear, Adam, sorry, just to give everyone a number. So t you said, I think you were about $10 million run rate last time yeah. we spoke. That would put right. you at about 12, 13 today. Is that right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, so we were hoping for a little bit higher, but I think what we found is that the sales cycles this last this year, particularly a little bit less than last year, have extended. Typically, our sales cycle is 60 to 90 days. A lot of deals are taking 30 to 60 days longer than that. And mostly it's not in the the the, uh, the the buyers, it's the procurement, it's the legal and the compliance. Uh, a lot of those stages are taking just incredible amounts of time. Um, the client says, yes, we want to buy the tool. We've, we've, you know, the, the CTO, the CIO, the VP of engineering, whoever the stakeholder is, has said yes. All the bureaucracy now takes another 60 days longer than it did a year ago. A lot mm -hmm. of it's budget. A lot of it's also compliance, security, cyber, uh, GDPR and privacy. Um, a lot of things just seem to be taking longer and 
it's hard to move those wheels of bureaucracy. Also, as I, you know, we're, we're dealing with these large regulated industries where it's much harder to exert pressure on them because they have a, a cadence for buying software and validating it and doing all the, uh, the compliance stuff that you can't really accelerate. So what does that mean for today? Still serving about 5,000 customers or slightly more? Uh, more than, yeah, more than that. I think it's about 10% more than that. Uh, okay. Because obviously we've added a lot of existing you know, deals and cross-selling into our other customers. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. Now, the secret valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your FounderPath dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. All right, so the teal is what a VC would pay, yellow is what private equity, and red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now, what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube. All these data are built from real-time valuation data points founders share with us on the show. So traction, 1.2 million, seed round, 3.7 raise, they sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only want to see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're going to go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you want to check this tool out, if you want to jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations. Or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. Yep, so call it maybe 5,500 today. Now, again, yeah. there's a lot of people right now listening, sitting on a customer base of 1,000, 2,000, but they want less customers that pay more. What process did you go through to figure out what customers you want to serve? A lot of people would say, I just download from Stripe. I sort from which customers have paid me the most to the least, and then I go find more that pay me the most. Uh, so we, what we've done, we did, we've done a two factors, two factors. One is we have some older clients that were on older pricing that we've been ratcheting up and that by natural attrition will we'll do that. The second thing is we found that we wanted clients that would have a longer LTV with us, customers that are going to be with us for five to 10 years because of the onboarding time takes time, the training, it's a wealthy complex suite and that we find that customers after the first year will stay with us for five to six years, but if the first one or two years are rocky, they'll leave. So we want to find customers that really align with the with the comp with the product, and not just the, the product they might buy, but the product suites they can upgrade. And what we found is, if we look at the sectors and the types of customer, it's customers that have a degree of compliance needs, but yet also need to be agile. So we we looked at the world in two lenses, which is the agile. DevOps, fast-paced technology companies. We look at these industries that are very traditional with lots of compliance needs. And we find the cases where the clients are trying to make a move to a digitized future, but they have these regulations. These are our, our most qualified clients. So think of a, a life science company that's got a, a relatively new medical device that they wanted to deliver it in a very agile way and take the market by storm, but they've got to get FDA approval in three years, five years, whatever it is. So they, they have to have a well-defined software system like ours. They can't just wing it together using spreadsheets or you know, other tools. Uh, so that's a great example of a client that we, we would now proactively target. And then similarly, clients in the um, manufacturing space that, again, they want to digitize their future. They want to be able to deliver software-defined vehicles, software-defined manufacturing. So they want to be agile and differentiate, but they also need to follow all the process they already have. Whereas a client that's never going to change, we don't want them as much. Or a client that's just, you know, an IT company that's just going to release software, change tools every year, um, they're, they're, they're not going to be a long-term customer with us, or they're certainly not going to expand and grow and be 
the reference that we would need. We want clients that only want to be a customer, but evangelize to other customers. For and us. so when you look at your concentration at the top of your book today, like obviously I don't name who they are, the logos, but your top customers say, do you have anyone paying the $500,000 per year? What's the top customer? What's the top group of customers paying? Yeah. So the largest defense type companies are probably paying, I'd have to get the numbers, but somewhere in the, I guess if you look at, across all their buying points, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, that would okay. be, and they're mostly the large defense companies or aerospace companies. Um, and then from there, you're going to go down into the large biotech, large IT companies, uh, manufacturing that are paying 50,000, 60, 70,000 a year. And there's a large, there is a, there is a large tail of the people paying 12 to 15,000, uh, mm -hmm. 15,000 a year. Um, which obviously forms the base of the pyramid. So you're not a sales guy, but if you want to go target the folks paying 10, 12,000 per year and get them up to 50, $60,000 per right. year, what does that look like? Are you putting another product in front of them? Are you asking them to buy more seats in the same, in the same business unit or how does that look? Uh, it's, both. It's first of all identifying additional uh, personas in this that use the, in their organization that would use additional features, and that's why we actually have three flavors of our product. So we don't just have, even though it's really one product, we sell in three distinct flavors, which target different personas. So what are the three? One, one, two, three. Oh, uh, sorry, Spira Test, Spira Team, and Spira Plan. One product, one for a QA audience. One is for a like an agile engineering team. One is going to be for a PMO program management, risk management team. You sell to the to QA team first. You can then expand it to the dev team, to the, the, the wider the team that's using the tool. And then you can go up the ladder to the PMO that's managing team of teams. And that way you're expanding from 15,000 a year to you know, 75,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Then we have a second product, which is an automation suite, more specialized. We don't go into that to try and sell to customers standalone because the cost of sales is much higher. The, the POCs, all of the the things you have to do to sell is much more complicated. But we've, when you've got a qualified client on our primary platform, we can cross-sell that uh, very effectively. How do you do that, Adam? 50. Do you have a sales rep that is dedicated to the customer that is responsible for upselling product two and product yes. three? Or is there an, a, a different sales team per product line? Uh, we, do, we, we used to do it per product. We changed it to per industry. So when you Why? sign up for us, uh, because of the discontinuity. So what happened is you bought product one, I get to know you know your problems, hand you off to product to person two, hand you off to customer success. So we've gone to an account management model by industry and by region. So if you're in North America and in uh, aerospace, you'll get one person. If you're in North America and healthcare, you get someone else. If in Europe, you get someone else. Across so on, all so of those. So then your sales team has to be well-educated in all three product lines. They can't be a specialist Correct. in one. That's right. Now, obviously, we do have pre sales engineers who can, you know, augment their knowledge but yes they have to know all the products and they have to know at least two or three industries and we're not big enough to have one person per industry as we get bigger you would expect to be of an industry in, in knowledge as well so we're taking uh, so our sales people have to be technically smart no sales and also understand the industries they serve which is quite mm -hmm. a big ask mm -hmm. interesting do you when you recruit sales reps do you recruit them from the specific industry that you want them to then sell to or do you just go find the best salesperson you can that knows how to hit quota uh, we've most of the latter, uh, and then we find the industries that they will fit best with. Um, and, and that seems to work best. Some have come. Okay. So just be clear, you find great sales reps and yes, teach them yes. more about the industry. Yeah. We're, we're not hiring a finance person. Expert. Yeah. We're not hiring a bio person. We have somebody who knows these kind of products is really good, good at communication, good at closing, good at following through. And then they'll learn the industry stuff. I see. Uh, How many folks are full time today? Uh, right now about 50, 55, How, I think. How many carry a quota? Uh, we don't. Uh, we, uh, we don't carry individual quotas. We have a, we have a company quota uh, and we, everyone's paid salary. We don't do any commissions. So that's one okay. unique feature. So how many are on the sales team? Uh, of the 55, including if you exclude customer success and you exclude partnerships, I think it's about 15. Okay, roughly. one five. And how many are actually yeah, writing, writing push and code every month? Engineers. Oh, so, oh sorry, uh, code. Um, team size across both the two platforms. So it's five plus... 515, about 20. 20. Interesting. Yeah. So did I hear you? I hear you're doing the math. Did you sort of put five engineers, do engineers work on all three products or do you put five engineers on product one, five on two, three? Uh, five is on product one and there is another uh, five, 10 to 5, 10 on the other core product. And there's another five that do like add-ons, extensions and, uh, you know, the... But you let them specialize products. in that same product. They don't switch yes. between products no, month to month. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. 100%. Very interesting. Okay. Why no quotas? Team, we found that team collaboration is the key. We, we did try it years ago. And what we found is that if it's my deal or your deal, we're not going to work together. And because the, the, the products are complicated and the industries are often inter interspersed, and we have uh, multinational companies, we, if you've got a sales team in the EMEA who's working with a sales team in North America, the, sorry, salesperson in North America, we want them to collaborate. We don't want them fighting over who's going to get the target. And that was the main reason. 
Very interesting. You uh, last year you were bootstrapped. Are you still bootstrapped today? We are. We've had many offers, and uh, we, we, we've talked to companies. We're not in the market yet, but maybe. What's the, what's the, what's the most interesting offer you got? Don't name the company, but what was the price? Like, what they say? Want to buy you for hundred million bucks or what? Uh, there's ones that want to do uh, probably less than that now because the valuations are down a bit. Uh, ones that want to merge. One is interesting. One that wants us to be part of a manufacturing, very very industry vertical approach. Other ones uh, want us to go you know, very horizontal across all industries. What was the highest um, offer you got though, Adam? That you rejected. We honestly we haven't got to a firm firm offer, so they're they're all talking you know six x eight x I would say, but we hadn't got right, into so sixty diligence. million, eighty million, yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. Okay, right, we have, right, exactly. So who someone's listening right now? They really love you. They really want to partner with you or buy or whatever. What is the right partner for you? What are you looking for? Uh, for a partner, it will be a, a firm that that has a service offering, a consulting firm that wants to expand their business, that wants to be able to extend their range of services, uh, and is willing to not just sell a product, but also build an offering at their company around that service. I see. And you would consider something between an $80 million and $100 million all cash offer today? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, to, when you say partnership, I think it meant to partner with the company to acquire us. Um, strategic, strategic alignment and cultural alignment is number one. And then the other stuff, yes, we can negotiate on equity or cash. I have to say the number one thing is cultural alignment. Yep. We, all the people here would want to work it has to be someone that we all want to work for, or at least hand over the company to. I don't. How much to, equity does the team own today? What's the ESOP pool you've set up? Ten percent, fifteen percent? No, actually none. It's uh, there's no. Uh, I'm sole owner. That's awesome. Okay, so you own 100. percent Do they have like phantom right. shares or anything? We we'll, we will do that when we if we if once we start. Uh, yeah, the plan is once we get near an offer, an actual offer, we would do that. Exactly. That's exactly right. We do a phantom uh, stock plan. Adam, this is very sensitive, but you are very rich on paper, right? Do you already have some exit where you're able to go buy the house you want, build a family vacation when you want? Like, how do you diversify your net worth out of your SaaS company a little oh, bit? Uh, um, yeah, great. I mean, I have all the. I have uh, first of all, I have rental. I have real estate. Bleh, rental real estate, which is great because it, it's a nice cash generating asset that's uh, low, lower growth, but very, again, very safe and gives you that diversification. How many beds, uh, how many beds do you have in your, in your real estate portfolio? Uh, three, three single family houses. Okay, great. Uh, plus my own house. We yeah. live in the house that we love. The kids have gone, are in college, almost finished. So that's all paid for. Um, so there's not a ton I need. It's more, okay. it's more the fun of the chase. There you go. He, he keeps his expenses low and makes some money off his real estate, which is great. That's a nice, 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 nice position to be in. Now, are you guys, do you operate right at break even or is the company 10% profitable today? 20% profitable? Uh, uh, depending on the year, zero to 10. Some zero years to 10%, 10%. Some, to, okay. some years to be closer to break even. What do you think this year will be? Um, I would say around 5% just because okay. uh, the rate, rate's a bit lower than we'd hoped. I mean, still 5% and, uh, profit on 13 million AR. I mean, that's 500,000 bucks of profit this year. That's pretty good. Right. Right, right, and, that, and that's you know we, we want to reinvest it. We don't want to sit on cash. So it makes yep. sense. Yep, yep, yep. Very cool. Or if you do, you just go buy another investment home, right? Yeah, yeah. My wife's like, she she wants to go to California, so who knows? Get something, <laughs> out there. Get something out there to rent out and then move there afterwards if you can afford California. Who knows? Uh, that's awesome, Adam. All right, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, a book you're reading right now. Oh, I just finished reading. Um, it's called The Glass Hotel. I forget the name of the author. It's a, a New York author. She also. Um, uh, it's really, really good. It's a really good book. I, I really enjoyed reading it. I'm also reading another book by David Mitchell called, um, oh God, it's about Utopia Avenue. It's about a, a, rock, a fictitious rock band from the 1960s, which is just a great read. He's a great writer. He did Cloud Atlas, did Bone Clocks. I love his, all of his stuff. Uh, amazing. Number two is our CEO you're following or studying. Um, oh, geez. Uh, I always like Richard Branson yep. just because he's, uh, but I think I said that last time. That's okay. You can say it again. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the business? Right now, instantly. I love instantly. Uh, we just started using that to cold emails and prospecting. And it combines the best of Apollo and Zoom Info and a bunch of tools. So I love instantly. And guys, if you want to hear the instantly story, search Latka instantly on your podcast app oh. or on YouTube. We had them on the show. They went from zero to $2.4 million run rate very quickly, starting off as an agency model, moving into SaaS. Really cool story there. Uh, glad you okay. glad you liked that, Adam. Uh, mm -hmm. number, uh, number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, eight. Okay, good. And situation? except when I'm in jet lag, except when I'm jet lag, <laughs> I came back from Dubai and I was wake, sleeping wake at two in the morning. Sorry. Do you have customers in Dubai? Uh, yes, we do. We just closed our first one a week after the conference, actually. Wait, what was that like? I mean, is it the same sales process as in the UK or the US? Um, small customers, well, sorry, small companies in Dubai, like anywhere, they'll buy with a credit card, easy. Large companies, you've got to have an office there, presence there. You've got to do a lot more of that uh, in person. What's the, what's the inflection point? Anything below 10,000 contract value, credit I card? would say, yeah, sounds about right. And also, is it, is it a government enterprise or is it like a private small 
like a lot, a lot of firms there are Indian companies that have set up shop there uh, or, or, or other companies. Those private companies, easy to sell to, 10,000, 15,000. Government entity that's building out a large part of the infrastructure, that's a whole different beast. Interesting. Okay, so married, two kiddos, they're out of, off to college. I yeah. believe you had a birthday, so you're 48 now? December 4th, so coming up, not yet, uh, almost. <laughs> okay, so still 47? Mm-hmm. All right, very good. So 47 years old, last question. Something you wish you knew when you were 20. <laughs> Raising kids, what a pain. Uh, but we love them. Um... Uh, uh, I don't don't worry about what other people think of you. Do what you do what you enjoy. Do what you love, and don't let people tell you you can't do it. That's yeah. why, yeah, that's what I would say. I love that, guys. Inflexure was launched in 2007. They serve customers like large defense contractors, supply chain companies, a mix of on-prem and cloud solutions. They'll do a million dollars per month in revenue, up from 830,000 a month just a year ago. So nice growth, serving 5,500 customers. Many customers pay have several hundred thousand per year, which is great. Nice expansion there. And he's done this all bootstrapped, which is incredible by Adam. He owns 100% of the business. The company will profit, call it 5% this year as he looks to continue to scale. Uh, we'll see what happens next. Adam, thanks for taking us to the top. Thanks so much, Nathan. Have a good one. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers. They try and do a deal live, and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at NathanLacka.com forward slash Slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.